Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I call to order this April 19th regular session of the Grant County Board of Commissioners. Please join us in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any uh, changes to the agenda? Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. <laughs> any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Me, uh, agenda approved. Uh, item number four. Uh, Report from Gila Regional Medical Center. Welcome, CEO Tapi Arias and CFO Richard Stokes. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us again this month. Um, I don't have a lot to report to you from. I, I, from our strategic planning session, but I do want to mention two things in particular. First of all, I want to thank all the commissioners uh, for allowing us to do a presentation on our strategic plan for 2019 and the future of our hospital. I found the dialogue to be extremely informative. I found the commissioners to be very open, and I really do appreciate your your input, your questions, because I think it gave us all an opportunity to to look at things in a different manner. We enjoyed the questions, we enjoyed the camaraderie, and and as you know, Gabe said to me, I think we ought to do this more often, and I do. I think that we need to do some strategic planning together every year, and I found that most beneficial. So thank you so very much. The um, Second thing I'd like to share with you is that I don't know if any of you know realize this, but hospitals all across the nation are surveyed every three years by a group called the Joint Commission. Uh, this is an accreditation body that comes in and validates your quality, validates what you're doing, validates operations, um, not financial operations certainly, but how how you how you look at patients and take care of patients. It has been, they have been here for two days, two grueling days. Today is their last day, and we won't know the result of that, although they have, they will give us a laundry list of things to work on. But they work in tandem with CMS, so there are a lot of standards that most hospitals have never seen before that, uh, that we are being surveyed by. And our staff is doing remarkably well. I'm very, very proud of them. Um, they are able to answer questions that um, I think that even the surveyors were surprised they knew the answers to. So I'm, I'm very, very blessed to be working with such a good group of solid, committed individuals in our hospital. Uh, the last thing I would like to share with you is that there are several items on our strategic plan that we presented to you that were dated and slotted to start on our fiscal year 2019. And I want you to know that we have already started with those, with many of those. Uh, some of them went into effect last week, some this week, and some next week. So we are right on course with what we told you that we would be doing. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Richard because he, I believe he passed out our finances for you. I'm sorry that we didn't get that to you beforehand, uh, but they're here now. And Richard has some fairly good news to share with you. Okay. Um, thank you for having us tonight, today, and I'm really glad to be here. Uh, do you guys, did, did you receive the information we said yesterday? So the first report is... It's the one with the grid on it. Yeah. Yeah, and I apologize for not sending that to you. Uh, you know, I'll just chalk it up to my inexperience in, in communicating with the council. We, uh, I did not realize it was my responsibility to submit the data. It will not happen again. 
So, if we go ahead and move forward, and we'll just talk, and you get, and y'all can ask questions. Just, just a minute, just for clarification, I, you did get this through the county. I got this from Manager Webb. Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. so thank, thank you. We got the information. That's, okay. That's appropriate to send it to Shirley. Yeah. Yes. That's perfect. So you did perfect. Thanks. Thank you. All right. So for the month of February, which was the eighth month of our fiscal year. Uh, we had uh, eight eight point seven million dollars in net patient revenue, uh, five point three million in operating costs, which brought our uh, excess revenue over expenses for the month of February to three million sixty thousand dollars. And I'm going to I'm going to explain how that happened in just a second. For a year to date wise, that brings the hospital's loss uh, down to one million one hundred fifty eight thousand dollars. So the real question is, without first of all, the hospital made approximately four hundred thousand uh, dollars just on its own. Uh, we received a letter from the uh, from the state related to the eleven fifteen waiver, which deals with uncompensated care reimbursements and uh, the gap between what Medicaid pays the hospital and what our actual cost is. So we adjusted the uh, financial statements based on the letter from uh, the state of New Mexico. So we recognized uh, $2.7 million uh, in February as a result of that letter. Now, the letter also addressed multiple years of, of different issues. One was the 2018 uncompensated care uh, reimbursement and year to date, or annually, this calendar year, where they're going to pay the hospital $8.6 million. So uh, part of the 2.7 was the first quarter uh, of, of that. Uh, well, it was, a, it was a combination of the first quarter of the UC payment, the uncompensated care payment, and a portion of the 2017 quality incentive payment. That was $285,000. And we also received uh, notification that in 2016, the, the hospital was underpaid by $3.8 million. And during the uh, reconciliation that occurs two years in arrears, uh, you, you know, so they, they perform an audit of all the hospitals in New Mexico. We were one of the one one of the hospitals that were underpaid, and so we uh, we booked a receivable for that. Now, so we have notification from the state that we're going to receive what I booked at 2.7 million dollars in February. On April the 17th, the hospital received uh, six million two hundred and sixty-four thousand. $146. So uh, unknown to us and what normally happens or what happens in other states that I've been, for the 2016 uncompensated care shortage, they usually recoup from the hospitals that were overpaid and then redistribute. But in our case, they went ahead and paid us the $3.8 million Tuesday. They also paid us the first quarter of the 2018 uncompensated care at 2.1 million and then they also paid the 2017 quality incentive payment of 285,000. So and that makes up the 6.2 million dollars that we received Tuesday. So there'll be an, another adjustment uh, in the uh, March financials to true it up to what we actually received. On the next page of the report, and, and this report is one that I've that I designed several years ago, and it's really just to pass along the real critical information. And in our finance committee meeting, we get into a lot more detail. But, but as an overview, this will kind of give you a sense of where we are for the month. So, for uh, under the volumes, charges, and KPIs, which is page two, uh, patient admits, we had 181. That's 24 more than uh, this time last year. Patient days, we were down 106 days from last year, which is a good thing. Uh, average daily census was 16.5. Our average daily census was 
uh, patients lower than previous year. That's a good thing. And why it's a good thing is by the next indicator, the average length of stay for February was 2.5 days versus 3.6. So we kept patients longer last year than we did this year. And uh, which, which from a reimbursement standpoint is not a good thing. Now, that's the average. So you know, we had some patients that stayed longer. We had some patients that stayed shorter. Emergency room visits, we were down 73 from last year. Uh, outpatient visits, we were down 190 visits. Uh, uh, so 190 sounds like a lot, but we had 3,515 outpatient visits. So uh, it is, it is concerning because it's a downward trend, but, it, but it's not significant. Uh, clinic visits were up 329 over last year. Surgeries uh, were up by 60. Oncology visits were down 499, and I think we all understand the reasoning behind that, which we were working very hard to uh, ramp that, that service line up. Births were up four. So cash collections, to get moving down through the KPI section, we collected $4.9 million in February versus 4.68 last year. That's a $223,000 increase. Uh, days cash on hand was 43 versus 67 last year, so we we dropped 24 uh, days of cash. Our days in net AR was uh, stood at 71, uh, that was up 24 from last year. And I think I think uh, uh, council will understand the. That feeds directly into our discussion last Thursday night. There's, there's some issues that we need to address there, and we are addressing them. Uh, days and accounts payable stood at 50 days. That's up 10 days from last year. So it, it is up some. The standard of, for AP days is anywhere from 30 to 40 uh, days. Uh, so you know, we're a little bit above, but not a lot, not a lot. Uh, daily expenses. We uh, last year it cost us sixteen thousand dollars more more per day to run the hospital. Uh, daily revenue we're up fifteen thousand dollars. So we got those those two indicators moving in the right direction. Cost down, revenue up. Uh, and then FTEs we're down twenty one from last fiscal year. And I did, I did put a chart on, on here related to our oncology visits. That knowing that we're in the ramp up phase for that service line, uh, but you do say we, we are on an upward trajectory, but we're, we're obviously not where we want to be. And then the next page just deals with, uh, our payer mix, uh, what, our, our payer mix from our revenue and what's sitting in our accounts receivable. I did hand out uh, some information for you that I wanted to talk a little bit about. So, you know, the first one is days cash on hand. And you, you can kind of see on the report that, you know, we, we, we're on a, a fairly downward slope. N not as bad as I've seen in other places, but still it's not the direction we want to go. So you'll see in March we ended about a little under 40 days. Um, you know, and that was by design. I, I, so what I did in, at the end of March was I, I authorized uh, a little larger than normal accounts payable run so we could liquidate some of our uh, accounts payables, knowing that it was going to drive our, our day's cash on hand down. But I also knew I was going to get a payment the middle of April. So that, that was by design. And I did note on the report that we did receive $6.2 million on the 17th. Now, you know, so we were around 40 days. At, uh, once the, well, now that the $6 million is here, we're going to be somewhere around 80 days of cash on hand now. And I didn't do the calculation. I haven't done the calculation yet. So now what, we, what we'll be challenged with is, you know, how are we going to relieve our accounts payable? You know, what, what else are, are we going to do with this one-time the, the one cash, primarily the 17 quality and the 16 
uncompensated care payment. That's a one-time cash flow, so we just need to be a little careful how we spend that cash. The next page I wanted to uh, kind of give you a, a snapshot of where we've been over the physical years, kind of where where we've ended. So you know, in 13, we you know we're nine million dollars underwater. Uh, we made a little money, 1.2 million in 14, and 15 we lost three million, 16 we lost 4.3, 17 we lost 2.6. This year, I'm projecting that we're going to uh, end up somewhere around a half a million dollars underwater. Uh, I can promise you we're doing we're doing what we can do to get that closer to zero. And if you look at the final page, you'll you'll see it uh, by month for this physical year the losses. So uh, July uh, we had about a one and a half million dollar loss, and then it jumped or it decreased to about 1.2 and. And then another month at 1.2 underwater. October, we got really close, about 400 underwater. November, we were barely underwater. December, we made a profit. January, we made a profit. February, we made a profit. March is going to be a profit of approximately $700,000. The activity month to date for this month, April, uh, we are going to exceed budgets on revenue. So we, we, the, the picture is looking brighter. And uh, again, as, as Ms. Arias indicated, we have initiated certain projects. Uh, one project dealing with how we build claims uh, kicks off today, uh, about 20 minutes ago. So we, uh, we have multiple projects, start, one starting next week, another one starting the week following that, all to improve the revenue cycle. And I was reading a report recently, the, 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 of the top four concerns for CEOs across the United States for the last several years, the revenue cycle has been in that top, top five areas of concern because it, it can get away from you very quickly. And uh, so we, but you have, you have to monitor and manage that process daily. And that's what we're doing. So that's kind of my report in a nutshell. Look, can I answer any questions? Any questions? I just want to make sure that um, I heard, um, heard you right. So the $6 million is... The first quarter of uncompensated care reimbursement for 2017, all of 2016, and then a 2017 following payment. Is that yeah. correct? Uh, almost. Almost. <laughs> okay. Let me put my page back to where I detailed it. Well, that's, I, I probably, yeah. that's a preface to another question, so maybe, okay. maybe we, um, so I'd like to know one of the, one of the, well, so one of the things that has come up multiple times in this conversation over the last few months is um, the uh, compensation of care providers. And so are you considering at all using the quality payment to uh, create some sort of bonus or something for care providers? Yeah, in fact, so, uh, uh, our plan was to start looking at... Okay. <laughs> Our plan was to uh, start looking at that this week. Well, however, the Joint Commission did walk in the door Tuesday morning. So to answer your question is, is yes. We, we are going to be looking at how we, can, how we can move compensation in the organization because, as I said, as I mentioned to you, uh, you guys earlier, you know, that's, that's one of my top priority, mine and Taffy's top priority, because we haven't been in the position to do that up to, until now. And so, you know, as we, as we previously discussed, the reason why I have, I have started hitting the revenue cycle as hard and as fast as I have is because I'm well aware that our, our employees need and deserve uh, a, a compensation adjustment. And so, yes, ma'am, we will be looking at that. We'll, we'll direct HR tomorrow to begin that process. So obviously, a quality bonus is directly related to your caregivers. So Absolutely, yes, ma'am. 
So um, the other thing um, is that the uh, the daily expenses have gone down by about sixteen thousand mm-hmm. dollars on average. Um, and we talked about this a little a little bit uh, last Thursday. You and I did. Um, yes, ma'am. Can you give me an idea of what that daily expense would go up to if we were compensating nurses at some somewhere close to market? Well, so when I, when you say nurses, I did I did take the one well, last week. I did ask HR to give me a snapshot of if, if I if I gave all the bedside RN nurses nurses a five percent increase, what would that be? And the answer came back at three hundred eighty-five thousand dollars a month, a year, a year. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so about ten thousand dollars a day. Right. Three sixty-five. Yep. Yep. So about a thousand dollars a day. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, just to follow up with that. Uh, what percentage of nursing staff does that include? Because I, uh, the term bedside care uh, isn't a division that I'm familiar with. Okay, so you know we have nurses that actually, uh, you, you know, is at, they're at the bedside. They're providing direct patient care. We also have RNs and administrative positions, and that's where I make the distinction. So, so in my mind, you know, a highest priority is to address the, the needs at the bedside because I, I you know that's why we're there that's why we're here too. and so what percentage is that of the staff of the nursing staff I, I don't know off the top of my head wild guess three-fourths I, 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 I hesitate yeah. to say that but right. I would imagine it would be more than half yeah. so with the um, <clears throat> With the payments and affecting the, the days of cash on hand and the fact that you've cut expenses, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would it be fair to assume that um, some sort of relief for bedside nurses might be coming very quickly? Um, I, yeah. I, I think, Commissioner, I think that's um, how you turn very quickly. It's going to start the... We're going to start looking at it tomorrow, and we also have to do a wage analysis, which we have the report now to do that. And that is not just what it is in this area compared to other areas, but also uh, equity amongst that group itself. And we have to make sure that there is uh, that things are equal and that they are fair, and that they we are not cherry picking one individual over another, but that we are making this fair for all of our caregivers. Um, so as, as Richard said, the bedside nurse, the bedside caregiver is, is certainly the most important uh, focus right now because we can't afford to lose any more. So do you have any target date for um, doing the analysis? And the analysis will be starting tomorrow. It usually takes about a week to do a good job of that, and then after that we can make a determination as to a percentage or a dollar amount that needs to be so invested. So you can know something as soon as two weeks from now? Probably, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Questions? Yes, go ahead. Right, thank you again for the presentation. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us what the basis is for the quality uh incentive payment what what standard are they using okay so in in new mexico uh, like all states you know the hospital they give you a menu of, of, of areas to to work on and improve and the hospital and I've, I've read through the report very quickly it was you know obviously it was done more than a year ago but the but the hospital picked two areas to improve upon and then we had to report the results, and based on that report, that report, uh, you know, we we earned the uh, two eight two eighty five. And so I guess I'm less concerned about the older one. What, so does that mean we've picked two uh, that we're currently working on that we will see potentially an incentive payment next year? Yes, sir. And what are those? Uh, 
I have not looked at the current years yet. Uh, that would be something Tanya Crucio would be managing okay. uh, as our chief quality officer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we can get that report to you. Yes. We'll be glad to do that. Okay. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. And my second question uh, was about the transition to uh, contractor for the billing. Yes. How is that going? Well, sir, they started about 25 minutes ago. And it's going uh, well. So I expect I expect answers. <laughs> <laughs> so really, uh, so what, what what the company is doing today is that they're assuming responsibility for the initial bill. And so the staff that we have currently uh, in-house, they're working all the denials and, and, and all the rebilling that needs to happen. But for today or this week and probably for the next week or so, they're only, they're, they'll be working the initial bill. And why that's important uh, you know, the cleaner you can get the initial bill done, and if you if you know exact, if, you know if you're really skilled at that, you, you know it will increase cash flow. So that's where you want to comp, uh, concentrate first. Okay, I look forward to hearing next month that it's still going really well. Yes, yeah, sir. Thanks. Uh, we Thanks also much. just to give you an update though. You, you know, there are some issues with Meditech, uh, and we and we talked a little bit about this at the meeting, but for those that, that were not there. Uh, the the medi the Meditech table for medical records, the rebuild optimization of that will begin next week. The optimization in the business office will begin the week following, in two weeks. So that's going to help a lot. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So you talked about uh, the 2.7 million dollars uh, in February that. Uh, extra that resulted in an over $3 million profit for yes, February. Sir. Yes, sir. And my question to you was this morning, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly. Yes, my sir. question to you this morning is why didn't that show up on a, as an increase in the days of cash on hand? No, a good question. I'm, and I'm, I think you answered, well, go ahead. Well, I yes. think you already answered it, but go ahead. But, but it's important for everybody to understand the hospital operates under accrual accounting and not cash accounting. So we earned that money. So we, by the accounting rules, we were able to recognize that revenue, understanding that cash was going to, would follow. Which, you know, that's standard accounting practice. Now, by the same token, you know, we've heard, and I don't like to get into gossip or anything like that, but, but by the same token, um, you know, accounts payable is managed the same way. So when we order something this month, it, it's recorded in this month. So it's, it, we, there is no holding bills and not recording bills. Uh, it is what it is. And then as, as we get cash, we relieve the accounts payable. That's why you'll see AP days kind of move around a little bit. So we do follow accrual accounting. And while Joint Commission is here this week to take a, you know, to survey us on quality, in September our external financial auditors will be here to make sure we're following the accounting rules. Okay. So, you know. And so, did I understand you to say that um, you took care, you took, so, so have you received the 2.7 million yet then? Or? Yes, sir, we received uh, 6.2 million on Tuesday. Okay, and so that you used some of that money to take care of old we will. bills. We will this this week. We okay. will be our, our accounts payable run will be a little bit larger. But again, to your question about how we're going to compensate staff, you know, I can't go out and spend all my money on AP. I've got to take care of our staff, which is my number one priority. So you're you're actually withholding the payment of. I mean, in my little business. It's, we pay our bills as soon as we get them, so it sounds like in, yes. in your business you can withhold payment of bills. So, you know, when you manage accounts payable, you know, one, one thing, so the, the 50 days that we're at right now is overall. So, you know, I have some accounts that are absolutely current, and there's some accounts that, you know, may be out there at 60, 65 days. It depends on, so internally, and this is how all hospitals do, you know, we, we, we assign a category A, B, and C to vendors. And, you know, as cash gets tighter, you know, we don't pay the C vendors. We pay the A and B. And then there's vendors like our, our drug dis distributor. We have 10 days to pay their invoices or 
it costs us a lot more money. So, so that, that's how we manage our, how we pay our accounts payables. Okay, and so the goal would be as you get more financially stable to get the, that, those well, days of accounts well, payable down. Well, like I said, the industry average on those, or, 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 or I, my, the benchmarks I, I've always used is anywhere from 30 to 40 days. This is a reasonable overall AP day. And you're at 50 now, yeah. Yes, sir. So, I mean, I, I've got some work, and I admit that. We've got some work to do, but it's not as bad. I've seen a lot worse. Uh, I've seen, actually, at uh, one hospital, um, our AP days were like 15, and this, I was working with for a management firm at the time, and, and um, they said, yeah, you know, 15 is a little too aggressive. You need to stretch it to 30. And, uh, okay. Keep your legs I mean, that gives me a picture. Thank you. Mr. Yes. Ross? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I was, I'm glad to see that staff is your main priority. Thank you very much. And mm -hmm. But what is happening now with our new uh contractor in billing are they going to keep the employees they already have are they planning to lay them off how's that working out uh, well you know all right so i have to be really careful because i'm talking about hr issues mm -hmm. uh, it has been it, the staff has been apprised of what's going on and why and in the in the timetable so we are evaluating uh, right now, you know, uh, who, who, who has the skills necessary and who does not. Uh, and so how we handle that will be dictated by what uh, our HR policies require that we do. And I've had a long conversation with our HR director about that, so it's not just GRMC's policies that affect how we're going to move, but it's also all the state regulation, the EEOC, and all this. So, so there had to be a prediction of how many will be terminated or laid off or ripped, whatever we want to call it. Do we have an approximate number? Um, yeah, you know, I'm a little bit hesitant to to really get into the details in, in an open session as it relates to HR issues because it's not fair to our employees for them to read about it in in the press. Uh, but, yeah, they're not yeah, going to do anything but, like but that. Let me, let me just let me just respond to this and this question this way. We have lots of holes and uh, vacancies mm -hmm. for people to be able to move into if they have the skills to do that. And we do that. That's, wh that's how we take care of individuals. Um, there, are certain, there are certain jobs in this world that unless people keep up with their skills, um, progress, you know, it, it just happens. You know, that's why you know, you see people going back to school. That's why our hospital in particular pays tuition reimbursement for people to have that opportunity to continue improving in their roles and to continue looking in the future because, as you know, nothing ever stays the same. So, uh, you know, my, my, my husband hasn't learned how to use a computer yet. You know, God help him if he ever had to get a job. But, what kind of program do you all have to better your employees? We are well. We have tuition reimbursement that we pay for people to go go back to school. Um, it does show a commitment on their part to continue working for us if we invest in them. But we do invest in employees all the time, all the time. And Ms. do you know what percentage of your employees utilize that program? I don't think nearly as many that should. Because it's like free money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I got a question. So, Richard, um, when you talk about the extraordinary payments that you received, what the, that you booked in in February, March, mm -hmm. February, and, and are receiving in March, um, what part of that do you anticipate ever being reoccurring? Any uh, of the two point. $5 million will continue to reoccur through this calendar year uh, on a quarterly basis. So you're going to get $2.5 million every quarter. So only the 200000 is not reoccurring. Is 
So you did the 10 million? The three, the three point, I believe it was 3.6 million related to calendar year 16 is not reoccurring and the calendar year 17 quality payment is not reoccurring. So let me make sure, be perfectly clear. You think you're going to get 2.5 million each quarter this year? Yes, sir. I'm going to get, well, I'm sorry, it's 2.158 million, $2,158,427. That's what we will receive. You're going to get that in March and June and March and July? We received the March payment on April 17th. 17th, yeah. So we got the first quarter on April the 17th. So in July, you know, we'll get another $2.1 million. October and? Yes, sir. Yep. It's the uncompensated care, right? It's called uncompensated care, but a component of it has to deal with the uncompensated cost of care from Medicaid between what they paid us and what our cost was. And that's, and they determine that cost based on our Medicare cost report. So that's why that cost report, it is really critical. Thanks for letting me clarify that. So that's the match that we put in, the $90,000, and you get that back because of that, right? I'm not aware of a match. Can we put the $90,000 in from the jury? That's correct. Yeah, the county puts that money forward, so we make a $90,000 quarterly payment in order for you to receive the $2.1 million. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's like, you just realized that was kind of odd. Okay, so considering that, because I wasn't convinced until just now that that was reoccurring quarterly. I thought that might be a one-time payment because that's how the old the old stuff worked. It was a one-time thing. Right. You had to budget throughout the year, not to spend it all at once. Yes, sir. However, you know, we've been doing a lot of touring of a lot of facilities and talking to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And a minute ago, I appreciate that you're going to go out and do a survey on your on your salaries um, that you would be considering, you know, or at least you you put forward a, a five percent increase for your your bedside nurses. But to tell you the truth, what we're finding in in what and this is not a study. But it's a lot of data that we've gotten in the last couple months that you're probably 15 to 18 percent behind on your bedside nurses. So it's probably going to be closer to a million or a million two a year to get them compensated properly to where you can be fully staffed. I'm happy to see that you're working on Meditech. I know that's that's been a mess. You inherited that mess. But I hope that, that you get that pulled out, and, and it, we did find out that a lot of people use it mm -hmm. in our last in the last couple of months. Uh, now the other, and none of them are really very happy that they need it. So that that, yes, that makes you feel any better. Um, now, if, if I may, uh, you know, I've talked to people that are on Cerner and on McKesson and on Epic, and it, it's it's the same. It's, it's, it's really the same across the board. You know, nobody's really happy with what they have. Um, and yeah. I, I would like to make just one clarification. Uh, when Richard was presenting about um, hypo this was a hypothetical percentage. And that's what I said. Uh, so I don't want that in the paper that it's going to be for sure. I said, that's exactly <laughs> what I said. Was yes. it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but it was a you know, hypothetical was a starting, five percent would cost right. this much. Right. Exactly. And we know, we know that there's going to be fluctuations in that, and it does look more like a million to get us where we need. And, to I, and I said that I have a, a very unscientific opinion that it's between fifteen and eighteen. Yes. Yes. So well, I think that's pretty close, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, did I have anything else? And it'll be nice to see cash days on hand up around 80 again. I hope that we can try to maintain some of that. I know that some of it has to be spent. I know that some of it has to go to employees. Some of it has to go to getting payables back down to under 50 days. Um, 
might be moving in the right direction. No, you know, just so you'll know, my goal, my goal is 100 days of cash. That, that to me is the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, right now I'm looking up at the floor, but, but that's my goal. That's what I'm really working toward. Do you have a deadline or a, a timeline that you're looking at? Right in there. I got it. I got it. Well, you know. So here's the thing. I mean, as as we've talked about employee compensation, and you know, there's some capital needs the organization has, and 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 so uh, you know, I've got to balance. I've got to balance all those needs with uh, as our cash flow improves. You know, it's just the balancing act. So, you know, if, if I was held really tight on some of the other areas, I could get there really quick. Uh, but I can't do that. It's not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple more questions. Maybe it sounds like at least, um, sorry, yep. Commissioner Edwards does too. Uh, so tell us about uh, oncology days at the cancer center. Um, did, I heard a rumor, so I wanted that you've got a um, radiation oncologist coming. So this, did, this did you talk is about true. That? Yes, uh, this month uh, the radiation oncologist will be doing all of the uh, assessments on those patients, and in May we will start uh, radiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did you say May 2nd? I think it was May 2nd. That's I don't want to... That's our target yeah, date. Yeah, it was a target date, and I don't think that's been changed. So, not to belabor this much longer, but this is public information you gave us, right? Which one is it? Okay. It is now. It is. <laughs> okay. So, um, so he the regionals lost about $18 million over the last six years. Yes, sir. About an average of $3 million loss a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've presented uh, a program where uh, it's going to be way more positive than that. Mm -hmm. On an ongoing basis, yes. Uh, and so this commission, as you know, is facing a very tough decision whether Healy Regional can remain independent or whether we need a national partner that can provide capital. Uh, sooner and all the other resources that a national partner would have. So um, I'm looking at uh, at some information that I've been given elsewhere uh, showing that instead of losing $3 million a year, Healy Regional to thrive would be needing to make uh, maybe 7 or $8 million a year, uh, which is less aggressive than even than what you've proposed. How, so if you agree with that preface, then how confident are you um, that that can happen going forward? That Healy Regional can thrive financially and, and not keep losing, not keep the pattern of the last six years of the $3 million loss? Well, let, let me just start on that, and then I'll turn it over to him. That will give you the details on it again. And there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees for anyone. The best you can do is have your plan and to remain focused at all time on that plan and be able to weather the changes that are totally unpredictable to anyone. It, it is absolutely true that right now we could not infuse the money that we need to be able to infuse within a year. We could not do that today. However, we have a plan in place. And as long as we stick to that plan and we're not eroded by any other outside source, I think we'll be fine. Um, I, I think the numbers that you have seen in the past, I think we will hold true to those. And we are not, we are not ones to over-predict. We are ones to be very moderate because we are, we are safe. We play it quite safe. But when we look at how we start on these plans, um, I will give you an example. Richard brought something to me one day, and he said, uh, "This is. I think we need to do this. I think we could do this. And I said, can you do it by Friday? He said, well, I, I may need a couple of more weeks on it. But that's how aggressive we are on our plan. So I'll let Richard talk to you about that. 
So, you know, my projections that I presented uh, to the council uh, last Thursday night were, were based on conditions as they exist today. Um, I, I, have, I am extremely confident that barring any changes in, in, in Washington to, to reimbursement, uh, we should be able to, to hit those targets, and we will be working very hard to hit and exceed those targets because, as Taffy said, you know, with the exception of the critical access, I kind of gave you the exact number the study came back at. But on the uh, business office improvement, you know, that the, the number I gave you is on the low side of, of, of what we <coughs> anticipate because, it, it, you know, I, we have a lot of changes to to, um, to address. But and as you know, 55% of our business comes from uh, the government. So Santa Fe or or uh, Washington could change regulations tomorrow, and it wouldn't just affect us. You, you know, there have been, been, regardless of the ownership structure, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, they pay us the same with some, with some adjustments to it, but generally the same. Um, it, you know, so yeah, I'm confident that we can hit these numbers. Thanks. Any questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, I should have asked this earlier. Uh, when will you have a report from the Joint Commission on its on its accreditation visit, and when will the public have access to that? Uh, let, let me just say we'll get a tentative one today. We'll get a formal one probably within the next few days, uh, but it won't it won't be final until we get it in the mail, or until it's sent to me. At that point, then we can tell you what the status is and what we will be working on. So, we're not expecting the mail to take more than a week. No, I doubt it. it'll be electronic. Okay. Electronic mail. Okay. Yeah. So, overall, again, it sounds like not not more than two weeks, and we will have a report from them. Yes. That's great. Thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more that I kind of forgot here on um, on the uh, capital improvement plan that I know you guys you started working on that mm -hmm. so when will that be available and, and I guess maintenance capital improvement kind of by dates that's what you're talking about when you talk about that um, yeah so uh, right now uh, you know we're in the process of building our budgets for next year one being the our capital budget now one thing CMS requires is you know that we have a five-year cap capital budget so uh, you know we're, we're building that now so what I presented to you what was what has been presented to me to date now there's going to be as we continue to tighten down on the budget cycle we'll have adjustments to that there's no question of that because I can look at it and see that there's some items not on there that I expected to be on there and then, you know, without getting into anything that we've done in executive sessions, yes. as far as your as your uh, uh, your planning in the future, but, but I would be interested in knowing whenever you get those plans done, if we could have a copy of them, and see uh, specifically maintenance and capital. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chair. So, um, Commissioner Billings was talking about um, $78 million a year to thrive in my back of the napkin calculation. Um, if uh, Commissioner Caston is correct, about 15 to 18% below um, salary on um, staff, that's uh, 3 to $4 million a year in increased cost of payroll. Um, because yep. um, I'm assuming we haven't given other staff raises when we haven't given bedside nurses raises. That's mm -hmm. sort of what my thinking is. So it's just like I said, it's a back of the napkin calculation. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good sized number. Mm -hmm. um, at what point, uh, given the capital needs and the needs that you have uh, to get staff? Um, to be fully staffed and uh, parity for pay, at what point um, do you think seven to eight million dollars to thrive might be reachable? Well, we should be able to hit 
a six to seven million dollar improvement within this uh, within FY19. All right, so the critical access status is going to take you know around nine months, and the reason why I say nine months, it won't take us long to do what we need to do. But there's the the the, the, the physical intermediary Novaris has to approve the 855, and then this, we have to submit to the state. The state has to send an inspection team down, and and all that's at their timetable, not ours. Uh, so so that's why I say. You know, roughly around nine months, we should be able to get uh, that project off the ground. And, and remember the, the reserve that we have to have on that. Right. Now you, sorry. Go ahead. No. You just mentioned uh, critical access. Yes, sir. And can you talk more about that? Has the Board of Trustees approved that? The Board of Trustees to date, and, and Ms. Taffy, if you correct me if I'm wrong, has authorized us to do, to do the, the work necessary up to pressing the submit button on the 855. And so that's what we're working on right now. So I'm finished. There may be more. <laughs> You know, while we have a little downtime, I would like to, I'd, I'd like to make an observation, uh, if, I, if I may. You know, uh, Miss area started, well, what, last June, June, June time frame. And, and she, has, she has built a team of some, of some really highly skilled uh, employees, uh, of d directors that, that are going to drive the future of GRMC. Uh, probably, probably the most talented group of people I've worked with at, at any hospital. Um, so uh, I just want to make, you know, it takes a CEO a little bit of time from when they land to where they start building out their team. And uh, I, I, so I just, just wanted to make a comment that, that uh, I think it's an excellent team that we've assembled in Silver City. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want one more clarification, not just to keep you here all day. I know you have things to do. So the, I didn't write it down, but I think you said six, seven million dollars realized by fiscal year 2019. That obviously doesn't include critical access. No, sir. Yeah. Okay. So critical access would be forthcoming and in, in, in addition to that. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. And the three to four million dollars in potential salary expense would come out of that, or that's an addition to? Yes, ma'am. Now, you know, without getting into a whole lot of um, detail about this, so you know, one of the one of the projects we're going to be working at working on in the new fiscal year is a labor management system. So. You know, it will tell us that, and I'm gonna, I won't use lab as an example because they're really easy. Um, to do this many lab tests, I need this many FTEs or full-time employees. And that's something this, this GRMC has not had. So, you know, I can't tell you today if I'm optimally staffed. I've got people, but I, I don't know if I have enough and what I suspect we're going to find is we don't have enough in some areas we have too much in other areas that's what I've always found when we've deployed these systems so that's a major project for us and it's going to help us get that the uh, salaries and benefits the net revenue percentage is correct now we're running six in the 60 percent high 50 upper lower 60 percentage in that area most for-profits or most for profits run about 40, 45 percent of net revenue, salaries, and benefits. Most nonprofits run 50 to 55 percent. Most governmental hospitals run about the same thing, around 55 percent. And, and again, we do that, and that happens in the nonprofit world and government world because we maintain unprofitable service lines, but the but the community needs them. And so we're at a, a, from a pure uh, key performance indicator perspective, we, we, we're at a little disadvantage because we do those things. But to answer your question, 
we will have a mechanism in place in the near future that will tell us if we are appropriately staffed. Well, I'm not sure that's a disadvantage. Oh, from a KPI perspective, it is. But from a community perspective. That's the whole purpose of having a community hospital. Agreed 100%. Other questions? We sure appreciate your time here today. Thanks for coming in and being so forthcoming with all this information. And to the members of the commission, I want to tell you that I have this deep appreciation for the issues at hand. I know that your decisions are not going to be based on the self, the one, but will be based on what's best for this community. And you have a very tough decision to make. I have been very, very delighted that all of you have taken such an in-depth dive into the finances, what happens, and you have obviously gained knowledge that you did not have before, but to gain an understanding of the enormity of the problems ahead of us. So thank you. Thank you very, very much for what you're doing. Thank you. Go take care of Jacob. Thanks again. Minutes, are there any corrections or additions to the minutes of the March? Oh, thank you. Public input. During this portion of our meeting, we welcome your suggestions and want to hear your concerns. It was just an accident that I skipped it. I'm sorry. It's not a question and answer period. Speakers will be limited to five minutes. Any individual who'd like to discuss something in more detail can request to be placed on a future agenda. So public input, anyone? Yes. Hello, Commission, staff, community. I am Sissy McAndrew. I have been a resident of Grant County for 22 years. I'm coming today with several hats. My first one is I was a licensed general contractor. I'm a certified energy auditor for both residential and commercial. And I just want to commend you on looking at energy efficiency retrofits for the county. I think many of you know that back in 2009, the county was actually involved with the town of Silver City in establishing the Office of Sustainability. And unluckily, that partnership did not continue. But over the years, that office actually saved the town of Silver City over $2 million. So what I would encourage as you're going through this process is that you peer match with the town of Silver City. They've established policies. There's no longer actually a need for that office because they're operating. The staff is trained. When they went to relamp downtown, they went out and found grant monies and fund matching through P&M and other processes. And so I think there's a lot to be learned right here locally about what can be done. And then I would also encourage you, we've got wonderful resources and vendors and contractors here locally. So I hope that you'll look at trying to keep the money local as you go through the investment in the energy efficiency technologies. The other is my hat with the Hospital Collaborative Council. And I want to apologize to you. I've been coming to you now for eight months. I've been begging you to be transparent. And as I started reading more of the press releases and the ads and the website, I started realizing I wasn't really hearing the voices of the people I know. And as I read the Juniper contract, I realized that they're assisting you with public relations. And so I understand that process. I look forward to the meeting next week, next Thursday night at 6 o'clock at the conference center where we'll have public input. I really hope we get to a point where we can have a discussion and it goes back and forth. Because I think that's the way we've always made decisions in Grant County. I think we need to get back to that. And I'm looking forward to that. So thank you so very much. And I'll see you next week. Other public input? Yes, Mr. Bowman. 
Jim Baldwin, County Resident. For the past years, I've attended three meetings. One of the meetings that I attended, and I think I'm the only person present that in this room that attended that meeting, was a meeting in the cafeteria of the Grant County Gila Regional Memorial Hospital. And it was a meeting where two of the commissioners were present and the third commissioner had a runner bring a letter with his um, decision over to the meeting. And all three commissioners voted to retain to keep the hospital. That was one meeting that I attended and I think I'm the only one. You did? Very good, sir. And you know it was a daytime meeting and it was in the summertime. You have on your agenda an item that is item 8I, approved, disapproved proclamation declaring April 8, 2018 as Continental Divide Trail Day. I support that, but I wonder if you know what you're supporting. If you stand out on the steps and look to the west, you can see the outline of the Silver City Range, which is by many people considered to be the Continental Divide Trail. I, along with Chip and Mary Cowan, have hiked and camped that trail from Highway 180 West up to PA, past the uh, Cleveland Mine, past the head of Walnut Creek. But that is not the Continental Divide Trail. You people, your predecessors in the late 1990s voted that the Continental Divide Trail would be from the Floridas, through Cook's Peak, through past the Royal John Mine, past Emory Pass, up to, um, I can't remember the name of the uh, fire station up there, but on up to Granite Peak. McKnight, thank you very much, McKnight uh, Guard Station. Those minutes are available to you, just as they were available to me when I was told of this. I did the research in the in the records, and I do have copies of the of the records where the county commissioners voted that that would be considered the Continental Divide Trail. So whatever you de decide today is your decision, but rest assured that your predecessors had a view going from the Floridas up to through McKnight and up to Granite Peak. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi, my name is Carol Plant, and I've been a long time resident here and live on the edge of the Gila National Forest. And I'm here to talk about the Holloman Air Force Base again and how unreasonable and how unbelievable it is to me. 10,000 sorties, which on average is 27 fights above our beautiful dry, very dry forest, 365 days a year. And on average, with 30,000 flares, it would be 82 flares being shot off into our dry forests on a daily basis, 365 days. And the chaff that they'll be using is aluminum coated fiberglass and plastic going all over the place. And the mid-air refueling is a frightening thought. They have millions of acres and they're bickering with Holloman's bickering with White Sands over not wanting to share with one another. And now that's become our problem. I'm shocked that this isn't the main focus of the city council. This happened in Taos and Taos stood up and stopped them from doing what they're doing to us now and they're doing it on a much larger scale with us. 
we are the caregivers of this planet. And the Gila Forest is the most beautiful place. I moved here and I fell in love with it. I love my home here. It's our responsibility to stand up for what can't stand up for itself. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Oh, minutes. Are there any corrections? Or oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Commission, I've never done this before. I'm not really good at it, but I'll try. I'm representing the Cosmic Campground. I know it's in Katrin County, okay? But we have visitors coming from all over the world right now. We have a website which gets between 850 and 950. It's a month. We have visitors from all over the world coming to that campground. It's the very first international dark sky sanctuary in the Northern Hemisphere. It is the darkest, one of the darkest places on the planet. It's within the Gila National Forest. And we have been working on this since about 2003. So we are now, we've been partners with the Cosmic, with the uh, Forest Service since 2016. And we have, it's been a, you know, hit and miss partnership, but it's working. And what we need is to have um, somebody give some attention to the fact that that is a dark sign. It, and you can't replace that. And you can't redo it. And I didn't really come to talk about Holloman, but it's very important. That place will not stand up to all those sortes every night and every day. It's just not, it's, it's really going to make a, a big impact. And I want to tell you that what we started this, uh, this whole idea for having a campground up there was the uh, brainchild of Bill McCabe and Ron Robertson. And what they were looking for was a way to bring commerce, tourists, money to Catron County. And this site has done that because it started out to make money for them and it is making money from th for them now. People are coming from all over the world. They come and visit for a week or two days or one night, but they eat in the restaurants, they go shopping in the grocery stores, they buy gas, and they take their, their car and themselves off home again and leave their money. It's what I call clean money, you see. And they come through here a lot. They fly into El Paso, and they come through and they get a rental car and they come up here and they drive all over the western New Mexico. Some of them are on tours that last six months. I mean, from out of the country. And uh, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile thing. Uh, it's, it's touched a lot of people. We have kids that come up there who've never seen a dark sky. They never have known that they could stand in the dark and be able to look over and see her. They've never been in a place that's been that dark. And so having this place and keeping it safe is really, really important. And um, we went to uh, Scotland in last September and did uh, a talk and I gave a, I gave a poster at the, international, uh, the European Dark Sky Conference and now we have people coming from all over Europe. And they personally have personally been to that, that um, campground. And it's really, to me, it's a benefit to you too. I'm, I'm trying to get my husband to put into a schedule and make an appointment to come and give a talk to you in a presentation. And we have the support of the Catherine County Commission we have from the beginning. And I'm sure that it would be something useful to uh, be uh, supported in Grant County. Thank you. Did you state your name for the record? My name is Patricia Ann Grower. Oh, if you did that, I missed it. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I have some cards that oh, sure. Thanks. I, would, I would like to give you all. Thanks. And I 
find out what you guys are doing. But how I find this, we'll leave somebody here in the business pass. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks. Minutes, any corrections or addition to the uh, March 6th work session minutes or the March 8th regular meeting minutes? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I'd like to move to approve the March 6th, 2018 work session minutes and the March 8th, 2018 regular minutes. Um, we'll go back to public comment in a minute, sorry. Uh, we have a motion to accept those minutes. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes approved. Was there someone else who wanted public discussion? Please uh, state your name for the record. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mark and Miller, and I'm a resident of Grant County. And I need to put my glasses on. The purpose of a corporation is to make money for its shareholders. Corporations are not inherently good, nor are they inherently bad. As is my want, I listened to NPR's Morning Edition on, the mon on Monday, April 9th, which had a segment about a man in Fort Myers, Florida, who had two CT scans done about three months apart. And you can Google NPR Morning Edition and read the transcript. The first one cost less than $300, and the second one cost almost 9000 The first one was done by a private independent imaging center, uh, Summerline, Summerlin maybe. The second one was done at Gulf Coast Medical Center Hospital in Fort Myers, where most of the hospitals, including this one, and most other health care facilities are owned by the Lee Health Corporation. With a virtual monopoly, this corporation charged what the market can, can bear. Here in Silver City, Gila Region, Regional Medical Center has a virtual monopoly on health care. If our hospital is sold to a private for-profit corporation, what can we expect? Considering that a corporation's main purpose is to make money, as much money as possible for its shareholders, fees may well increase significantly. The quality of service may diminish from its current four star rating to one or two stars if more money for shareholders can be generated by doing so. What concerns me is that you, the county commission, have hired Juniper for 10000 a month to evaluate the hospital, and that by August, we, the people of Grant County, will have invested 120000 into this endeavor. In my experience, it's hard to imagine a situation in which this amount of money is invested in it. Then you say, oh, well, what the heck? We'll just keep the hospital as is and then do nothing. However, this is exactly what needs to happen. Our hospital has, some fi has had some financial difficulties, <laughs> but with the new administration, they seem to be turning things around. Let's give them a chance. Let's not sell our hospital to a for-profit corporation. Thank you. Okay, financial reports. No. No. <laughs> what? Is that an action item? Well, you have to read it. Okay. Item uh, 6C, pursuant to New Mexico statutes annotated 10-15-1, uh, subsection J, the minutes of the present open meeting will reflect that for the following special meetings, the matters discussed were limited only to those specified in the notice of that closed meeting. The uh, March 26, 2018, March 27, 2018, April 9, 2018, April 10, 2018, April 12, and April 16, 2018. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve uh, the minutes. Yeah, we, we don't have to approve those. Sorry, we approved them all. Not an option. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'd like to. 
I think at this time I probably need, I'm sorry for the confusion, but I probably need to ask one more time, is there any more public comment? Because I don't want to skip anyone. Okay, thank you. Financial reports. Mr. Chair. Yes. I move to approve the April 11th, 2018 expenditure report. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. New business. Uh, approve or disapprove proclamation declaring the month of April 2018th as Fair Housing Month. Kim Clark and Sissy McAndrew, please. Did you want to have it read? I need to read it first. Oh. Yeah. Bernadette. Bernadette. Okay. Bernadette, would you read that proclamation while they're coming up? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners of the Board. Grant County Proclamation, whereas fair and equal housing is a right guaranteed to all Americans, and whereas the principle of fair and equal housing is not only a national law and policy, but a fundamental human entitlement, and whereas people must not be denied housing because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, handicap, or family status, and whereas the Grant County Board of Commissioners acknowledges the importance of assuring fair and equal treatment to all citizens, and whereas the Grant County Board of Commissioners, the Southwest New Mexico Council of Governments, and the Silver City Regional Association of Realtors will supply fair housing information to the public, and the county will display a fair housing proclamation at the Grant County Administration Building. And whereas the Grant County Board of Commissioners, the Southwest New Mexico Council of Governments, and the Silver City Regional Association of Realtors is committed to highlighting the 50th anniversary of the fair housing law Title VIII of Civil Rights Act of 1968 by continuing to address discrimination in our community to support programs that will educate the public about the right to equal housing opportunities and to plan partnership efforts with other organizations to help assure every American of their right to fair housing. And whereas the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics commits all realtors to providing equal professional services without discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, family status, handicap, sexual orientation, gender identity, and national origin. Now therefore, the Grant County Board of Commissioners do here proclaim the month of April 2018 as Fair Housing Month and urge all citizens to participate in appropriate activities to commemorate this event. Go ahead. Thank you. Welcome. Commissioners, staff, thank you for having us here. My name is Kim Clark, and I am the Association Executive for the Silver City Regional Association of Realtors. I have with me my current president, um, Sissy McAndrew, my past president, Kathy Carver, and Priscilla Lucero from the Southwest Council of Government, and we appreciate you declaring April the housing month. Um, the National Association of Realtors is doing a, and realtors um, throughout the nation are doing a year-long campaign because this is the 50th anniversary of Fair Housing, and their tagline is Fair Housing Makes Us Stronger, and it's true. Um, Fair Housing Makes Us Stronger as a nation and as a county. Um, so uh, thank you for the uh, proclamation. We are hosting a housing fair next Thursday at the county, um, at the business and veterans business and conference center. Um, we are, our housing expo is happening at the same time as the um, Gila Regional um, input meeting. So we hope you attend that meeting and then come over to the housing fair. We have um, some presentations from USDA. They've got a nice program that allows uh, a grant for seniors for um, rehabilitation. And then we have some um, uh, MFA is going to come do a program on first for first time home buyers. We have 20 vendors, so we just hope the public comes and participates in that. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Priscilla for just a minute. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you for having us once again for the proclamation. But most importantly, I just wanted to show the angle from a local government perspective. This is a requirement from any funding that is actually coming from Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD. So this is a requirement mandated in order for any community local government to receive the community development block grant funds. So this will allow for you to meet that compliance and uh, help us to seek additional funding for the county. Thanks. Is that it? Thank you. Is there a motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the proclamation declaring the month of April 2018 as Fair Housing Month. Second. 
Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. City Regional Association of Realtors report, uh, Ms. McAndrew. Hello there. I'm here with another hat uh, as president of the uh, Silver City Regional Association of Realtors uh, with a very good report for you. Uh, 2017 was the best year that we've had since 2007. Uh, we are starting to have at this point multiple offers on properties above list priced often and probably the greatest thing about that is they're appraising so that means that we're actually getting the sales uh, of course we're very concerned about affordable housing because uh, at this point our housing stock is getting pretty balanced uh, we have had no new construction if it's new construction at all it's been custom built so uh, we are getting into the same situation that's happening nationally which is uh, the cost of housing is going up. And when we're looking at affordable housing uh, for low and moderate income people, we're gonna continue to have a challenge. Uh, the downtown area is uh, very, very busy. Uh, we are starting to have sales. Uh, one of the situations with that is the fact that it's hard to get a commercial loan. So those properties are actually either being sold in owner financing or someone's coming in with cash. And what we're trying to do there is make sure that we're getting those people in touch with the Small Business Development Center. We want those businesses to succeed. We're also getting a lot of folks with the special zoning that we have, which is historic zoning. It's very unique to Silver City. It allows for a building downtown to be used as commercial or retail or a service industry, and it also allows for it to be residential. Uh, in that case, what we do is we work directly with uh, community development and the fire department to go in and help those uh, potential buyers realize what costs and what codes are going to be required in order for that building to have a multiple use. And the main situation is you need to have a firewall between the business side and the residential side. Uh, we, as I spoke to you last month actually, when we were talking about the F-16 uh, situation, the majority of people are coming here because they're out on Google, they're looking at climate, and they're looking at quality of life. And we are, the, we are up at the top. And uh, it's absolutely wonderful, but again, it's also a concern. So we have people now that are coming. Uh, some of them say, I'm going to wait and see what happens with the F-16 situation. I'm going to wait and see what happens with this hospital situation. So the things that you have to deal with are on the mind of the consumers. It's also interesting to see where people are coming from. We're getting a lot of folks coming in from Colorado. And that's because that state just took off in growth. A lot of that probably has to do with the medical marijuana but it is growing to a point that people no longer feel that they have a rural lifestyle. Uh, they're feeling that they're being encroached upon. So they're moving down here because of our rural setting. We're getting people from California, and uh, that's kind of interesting. They're uh, coming here because they're getting to retirement age, and they've been pulling in these big salaries, but now 
in retirement, they cannot afford to live in their existing home. So they are selling in California, looking to come here for an affordable lifestyle, a slower pace. And again, Silver City is one friend referring another, referring another. And uh, we're seeing a good flow of people coming in. Uh, we also are getting the folks from the northern states, those that uh, can actually make it out of the bad weather. Uh, are coming down here, but uh, the national weather patterns are getting some people in Florida are coming in, they're tired of being threatened by hurricanes. Uh, we've got people that are tired of, of shoveling snow. Uh, so we're seeing a, a transition of people coming here again because of our great climate. Uh, there was mention earlier today about the Continental Divide Trail. I just want to mention to you that's actually becoming somewhat of an economic driver, which is what we all were hoping for. And that's because we have hikers coming through, and I just started really seeing a flow this week. I don't know if you've seen them, but uh, you can tell they have those little backpack on and <laughs> really high tech and, and low weight. Uh, but they are coming through, and they're getting to know our community. They're getting to meet people. They're getting to see what Silver City and Grant County has to offer. And if they're not coming back, they're talking to family and friends and saying, hey, there's this great place in southwest New Mexico. You should really come down and look at it. So we're getting referrals from Continental Divide Trail hikers. Uh, as Kim mentioned to you, we have our uh, expo coming up, and I want to thank uh, Representative Rebecca Dow for really kind of stimulating that. We met her when we were up uh, for uh, the, our real estate annual meeting in Santa Fe in January. And uh, she said, there's this great USDA program. Let's get together and, and put something on for Grand County. So we're real excited about that. You can actually come before your 6 o'clock meeting. Uh, this is going to be running from 4 o'clock until 7 o'clock. So we're hoping that you'll join us. Uh, we will get statistics over to you, our current statistics. And then I'd like to come back in July and give you a quarterly update. And hopefully it's just going to be uh, more positive information for you, uh, more sales, uh, more gross receipts, and more property taxes coming in uh, to Grant County. Are there any questions at all? Commissioner Adams, go ahead. I just had a comment. Um, I just want to thank uh, Kim Clark um, and the Silver City Regional Association of Realtors for being flexible on Thursday night and uh, yielding the large space at the convention center to the commission for this important meeting. Thanks, you guys, for doing that. Appreciate it. Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions. You mentioned the difficulty getting commercial loans downtown. Yes. And then you discussed the unique nature of our historic zoning district uh, in which I live. Um, <laughs> is that the reason that there's difficulty getting commercial loans, or is that something else? It's, it's nationally, it's hard to get a commercial loan. Uh, it's specific also to Silver City, and that we had uh, loans that were made uh, in the last seven to eight years. They were startup businesses. They failed. And uh, we had some local banks that were really trying to stimulate, and so they were they were great at trying to loan money. Uh, but the challenge was we didn't have uh, the the businesses that were going to succeed, and that's why it's so great to pull in the small business development center, make sure there's a business plan, uh, make sure people have the capital to last that first three years. Uh, we're also seeing a flow of people. I forgot to mention. Uh, where businesses are moving around downtown. So some of them have grown, they're moving into larger spaces. Uh, if somebody moves off of the side street, like Yankee Street onto Bullard, they're seeing about a 30% increase in their business, just being on the main drag. Uh, we have, I believe at this moment, 13 properties that are in the historic district that are for sale. Uh, people are, the owners are starting to see that people are coming in, it's time to move forward. Uh, but again, uh, part of our job is counseling those sellers and letting them realize that they are going to have to be flexible in the terms uh, that they're going to be able to sell at because otherwise uh, the property won't sell. We also have uh, situations where downtown uh, surveys are very, very expensive because uh, none of the property lines are what you think they would be. Uh, we have a building 
over where Tranquil Buzz is and those very colorful galleries that we've probably one of our most uh, photogenic locations in Silver City. That's actually being subdivided and you've got common roof lines. So that's a challenge. We have a challenge with vacant buildings, which we're trying to work. Main Street's doing a great job uh, sending newsletters out to all the building owners, trying to get them to realize that if they've been using it as a tax write-off, uh, now's the time to maybe uh, liquidate that asset and get somebody in there that will help contribute uh, to downtown. And uh, so we're seeing less vacant buildings and uh, a lot of activity and a lot of discussion really with the building owners at this point. So it's very, very positive downtown. And I don't mean to cast any negative on that positive, but I was curious about the difficulty getting commercial loans. Uh, and, and part of that is uh, you know, the aftermath of uh, the changes at the Murray uh, Hotel where uh, there certainly were rumors that, that downtown was being redlined. And Not really, no. And I mean, you, I think probably one of the first businesses I can think of that uh, started this process was Shadow's Bakery. And, um, you know, that, that when that sold, that was a local bank that was with Ambank. Uh, but the people that bought it didn't even want the recipes. And they eliminated having the tables there for the coffee club, you know. So there's things where with small business development, we can have, help people get through that process. The other challenge we have is uh, the buildings to the south of Broadway, which those are a lot of the, the homes, there's some galleries there, there's some B&Bs. That's actually zoned uh, so that that could be commercial or residential. Now you start getting into a lender and they're like, well, if there's a fire, what, what are we gonna be able to rebuild? Uh, is it residential, is it commercial? It throws up red flags to them, throws up red flags to insurance companies. So again, it's something where we all have to work together uh, to make sure that uh, the buyer is not getting themselves in a, in a bad situation. We want everybody to succeed, but we have to work as a team and, and that the communications are open and we are doing that. I appreciate those answers. Uh, I wonder, my second question is a lot shorter. Uh, do you track eviction rates? We do not. Uh, uh, we could, our wonderful uh, executive director, Ken, we have, we have a lot of folks that uh, most of the property managers are actually in the real estate business as well. Uh, and we could, we could possibly do that, but then you've also got a lot of independent people uh, that are running out the buildings. It'd be very tough for us to determine uh, what's going on there because at this point we don't really have a communication link with them. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, Thank you. we'll see you in July. Thanks. Uh, do you have another proclamation to read us uh, proclaiming May 5th, 2018 is Give Grandly, Give Local Day? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners of the Board. Whereas the County of Grand is blessed by nonprofit organizations which provide invaluable services to our community, and whereas Give Grandly, Give Local Day, May 5, 2018, is the fifth community wide giving event hosted by the Grant County Community Foundation, online at www.grantcountycommunityfoundation.org and www.givegrandly.org. And whereas Give Grandly will be celebrating its fifth year, and whereas Give Grandly theme this year is five and five, hoping to raise 500,000 in five years. And whereas there are 57 registered participants, and whereas Give Grandly, Give Local Day shall grow the spirit of giving and raise as much money as possible for the nonprofits in the Grant County area. And whereas through the Grant County Community Foundation and its partner, the Southwest New Mexico Nonprofit Coalition, Give Grandly, Give Local Day, shall inspire the public to support our nonprofit organizations on this one day, May 5th, 2018. Now therefore, the Grant County Board of Commissioners do hereby proclaim May 5th, 2018 as the fifth ever Give Grandly, Give Local Day. And be it further proclaimed that for all citizens, it is the official day of providing financial support for all of the causes that continue to move over our county forward. Mr. Hudson. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, 
on behalf of the Grant Canyon Community Foundation Board, the Southwest New Mexico Nonprofit Coalition, and 50 plus nonprofits participating in the Give Grantly, Give Local 2018, we thank you for supporting this endeavor for the fifth year in a row. Our area nonprofits provide much needed services that enhance our quality of life in Southwest New Mexico. Since 2014, our communities have exceeded our greatest expectations. Donations have totaled more than 350,000 over the, over the uh, four years. And our goal this year is to reach the 500,000 mark for, for uh, five years. Everyone can be a philanthropist. We're asking the community to get behind Give Grandly. Large and small gifts combine for great uh, impact. Imagine what we could accomplish if our entire community contributed. Please join us at the Silver City Farmers Market from 8.30 to 2.30 on Saturday, May 5th for food, music, information, and unlimited community spirit. Online giving begins at 12.01 a.m. on May 5th at givegranley.org. And thank you again for your support to Give Granley. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Would you take a picture with us? Certainly. Take a motion. Oh, oh, sorry. Is there a motion to approve the, re the resolution? Mm -hmm. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion approved. <laughs> Jay, so they can go ahead because there's, there's nobody waiting on the other two. Sure. Okay. There's still three of us. So. Uh, agenda item uh, H, Motorcycle Awareness Month. Go ahead. Thank you, Bernadette. Whereas motorcycles are used as a regular means of transportation for commuting, touring, and recreation in and around Grant County, New Mexico. And whereas the Grant County Scenic Roadways make motorcycling a very popular destination for riders from around the country. And whereas the safe operation of a motorcycle requires the use of acquired skills developed through a combination of training and experience, the use of good judgment and thorough knowledge of traffic laws and licensing requirements. And whereas it is imperative that the residents of Grant County be aware show consideration and share the road with motorcycles on the streets and highways and recognize the importance of motorcycle safety. And whereas the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has declared May as Motorcycle Awareness Month, it is the desire of the County Commission to join the NHTSA in raising awareness of the growing number of motorcyclists on Grant County's roadways in order to help prevent accidents and most importantly, save lives. Now, therefore, the Board of County Commissioners do hereby proclaim the month of May 2018 as Motorcycle Awareness Month in Grant County and urge our citizens to be observant, courteous, and knowledgeable about motorcycle usage in our community. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'd like to make the motion that we approve the proclamation declaring May 2018 as Motorcycle Awareness Month. Second. Any discussion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, there's no one in here to receive that, is there? Okay, thank you.
Yes, I do. Quietly. Uh, approve or disapprove the proclamation declaring April 2018th as Continental Divide Trail Days. Bernadette, could you read that to us? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Whereas in 2014, the Grant County Commission issued a proclamation recognizing the honor of Silver City's designation as the first getaway community of the Continental Divide Trail. And whereas Grant County continues to provide magnificent outdoor recreational opportunities, including walking, bicycling, bicycling, hiking, and horseback riding, which appeal to an expanding number of residents and visitors from far and wide. And whereas engaging in regular outdoor exercise is known to improve health and well-being, our trails are beautiful, valuable, and freely accessible. They represent an integral part of daily life for education, fun, and fitness. And whereas world-class trails, including the Continental Divide Trail, enhance the quality of life for our citizens, increase tourist activity in the area, and offer an attractive recreational resource for young and old. And whereas many educational activities, including workshops and seminars, and trail work, as well as amusement and industry events, are scheduled for April 27th through the 29th, 2018, to celebrate and promote the trails and greenways of Grant County. And whereas the Continental Divide Trail, Trail Days events, are a chance to increase public awareness of Grant County's extraordinary trail opportunities and diverse outdoor recreational activities. Proclaim the importance of our local and national network of trails and greenways and celebrate the kickoff of the 2018 CDT through hike season and whereas we encourage residents to participate in the scheduled CDT Trail Days activities. Therefore, it be proclaimed, the Grant County Commission hereby recognizes the month of April as Continental Divide Trail, Trail Days 2018, and urges all citizens to make walking, hiking, horse or back riding on local tra trails a priority activity for themselves and their families, and a source of pride for them to demonstrate to all other commitment to preserving the wonderful, natural, scenic, and recreational qualities of Grant County Trails and open spaces. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Raul apologizes that he wasn't able to make it here to accept the proclamation, but asked me to come in his stead. And he also wanted to reiterate that you're all invited to the Continental Divide Trail Days on April 27th through the 29th, and it should be pretty fun. Um, it's on the Western New Mexico University campus and at the Seaboat Gallery for a, a 40th uh, birthday bash of the trail. So please all come on down and enjoy all the festivities. Thanks. Any questions? Comments? So I know the real truth why Ronald's not here, you know. Because <laughs> last night he was hypnotized by the hypnotist show in uh, at, at Silver, uh, Silver School's gymnasium, and he was the perfect person to be hypnotized. <laughs> they did not do anything mean to him, but he, he was definitely asleep. I talked to him after it was over with. He, he said it felt like it was two to three minutes and that, that he remembers lights going off. Uh, there was 27 people hypnotized. The guy was great. He did a great job, and I hope the kids with the FFA earned a little money. But that's why he's really not here, because he knew I was going to give him... <laughs> I thought he was still hypnotizing. You know, I don't know that. No, I talked to him afterwards. Okay. Any other questions, Thomas? Just a question, actually. I don't know if I'm missing uh, something important in Mr. Baldwin's uh, statement, which I found historically really interesting, but the heck if I'm going to send hikers over the Floridas and, and Cook's Peak, that, that doesn't make any sense. But am I missing something of importance? I, I don't know anything about that. Well, I'm looking at the veterans here. I was on the Continental Divide Trail last night, and it wasn't that Continental Divide Trail. Yeah, right. I described it as on. I was really actually on the Continental Divide on the trail. The one that I've ever heard of it. Okay. So I think it might be something interesting to look into. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not the Continental Divide Trail. That's not where it is. Well, you will not catch me on the floor either. Well, I've been there, and it is scary. Yeah, it is. I don't know. 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 Any other questions, comments? Okay. Can we have a motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the proclamation um, declaring April 2018 as Continental Divide Trail Day. Second. 
Uh, any, any discussion? And all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Where's the proclamation? Oh, don't you have it? Agenda item J, Grant County Surveillance Program. Uh, welcome Luis Alvarado, uh, Margaret Begay, and Chris Artisan. Good morning, Mr. Chair. My name is Margaret Begay. I'm the program manager for the 6th Judicial Court here in Grant County. Um, Mr. Luis Alvarado is one of my contractual uh, officers, and Mr. Chris Arvidson represents the Juvenile Probation and Parole Office. So we're here to just do a brief presentation on the program. Um, you've re received the reports. Um, just to highlight a little bit uh, in terms of the adult surveillance component, and these gentlemen are going to do the juvenile, um, we do employ a full-time surveillance officer through the state. Um, he's a male surveillance officer, one female contractual adult surveillance officer, two adult male contractual officers, and two juvenile contractual officers. I provide oversight. I have an administrative assistant. Um, in terms of providing oversight, uh, Adult Drug Court does some in-kind in terms of oversight. We do pay for some monies through the courts in addition to the Town of Silver City, which pays $20,000. Um, what did change this last fiscal year, and I highlighted the numbers for the adults from July uh, to current or to through December actually was because of the new law in terms of the release and the bond issues um, in terms of magistrate and district court and their decision. In addition to our reports, we had two letters. One was from district court judge Robinson and also judge Maureen Laney in terms of continuing funding for these critical programs. Um, I've been called upon from numerous courts throughout the state. We are not a pre-trial services program. We are strictly compliance and surveillance in terms of addressing, keeping these people at home, uh, addressing their curfews, allowing them to continue to work if need be in terms of the adults as well as the juveniles. But overall, trying to keep eyes and ears for the judges and also to keep the community safe. As you can see in terms of July stats, for the adults, um, we had 611 total visuals. Um, August, 455. We spiked in October with 647. In November, we had an additional spike. And then, so the trend is just going up with those magistrate court referrals. Most of our violations are through magistrate and district court in terms of the people that are released on this, pro on this program. If they are in violation, we do a non-compliance report to the judges immediately. There's a warrant issued. They're picked up, detained. Some of the violations could be that they test positive for any drug. They're out of their zone. So, for example, if, if they're allowed to work, they have a work zone that's created from 8 to 5, for example. If they're not home by 5.30, that zone, we get a notification. Um, our, they, they call us. We, we contract. The county contracts with Veer Tracks, who's the main provider for the GPS service. 
They notify us via email, via phone, uh, text, and then immediately we let law enforcement know that offenders picked up and they're immediately detained. Now, that's not the goal of the program to continue to incarcerate, but there are immediate sanctions or consequences if they do violate the conditions of release. So just to highlight the juveniles, are there any questions on the adults before we move to the juveniles? Okay, so for the juveniles, I just want to highlight that there needs to be a correction. I'm sorry that um, we did make a mistake in terms of March of this year on the visuals itself for the uh, March to date is 130 visuals. And then the attempted visuals, which were kind of high, um, it is 43 only. And last year when I presented our goal, and I had met with Ms. Webb on occasion in terms of a juvenile probation on the attempted visuals, we were really high last year. And that was our goal this year was to reduce that. Because what's the point of going out and checking on these kids if they're not home? And, and that's a waste of money, of your money, of taxpayers' dollars. And so those have been significantly decreased. Um, total visuals for fiscal year were 2,444. So that is incorrect per year report. Those are the correct numbers, 2,444. Attempted visuals were 233. And total contacts were 2,904. And Mr. Arvidsson said I was wrong, so I don't take that lightly, but actually we were, but I mean, it's okay to have mistakes. Um, I, I have people double check my, my work, but I've been busy, but there, there's no sense of, you know, the GPS program is a critical program. Uh, it reduced incarceration costs, and I think these guys are invested in their jobs. Um, they're out there all hours of the evening. Um, Mr. Ortega, who's been with me 13 years, moved with me from JPO to the adult. Uh, Luis has been with me almost 12 or 11 years. Um, we've been running this program uh, quite successfully. Uh, I think the adult piece of it is going to be another model program for the state. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to stay quiet about it in terms of I don't really want to say what we're doing because I don't want everybody to know exactly what we're doing, but there's tweaks. We're, it, it's a work in progress. I meet with Judge Laney every chance I get how we can improve. I meet with the district court judges, uh, the attorneys. How can we improve this? The jail. Um, I've met with Mr. Carillo on several occasions as well as Ms. Tranzazola to make sure that we don't lose the GPSs that they're cut off or, you know, tampered with. And so there's a big collaboration within this community to continue this program. Thanks. Uh, well, just in reference to the GPS, um, <clears throat> we've used uh, 22. Sorry about that. Um, we've had 22 of our juveniles from juvenile probation utilize the GPS through the county. We also utilize um, state funded GPSs. We prioritize those for the kids first if we're out of those, then we'll utilize our. Um, G, uh, county provided ones so that's been really good um, numbers have been down for us through the our court order our informal um, our courtesy program self-referred or referrals from truancy those have kind of maintained a little bit but um, you know like Ms. McGay said after last year's presentation we came up with a, kind of a what I call it Basically, where if there was an attempted visual or if there was a violation, we set up a, a little system for the kiddos to where they would end up. And, and that's only going to apply to, I think it's going to apply differently to our courtesy informal versus our formal. Um, our informal and our courtesy, they don't deal with the courts. So there's not going to be any type of warrant utilization there on them. Um, but that seemed to really help. We were averaging about 20 kids a month. Um, from last year to current, our highest was about 28 kids on the on our list that we utilize per, per month. Um, so I think that's really helped us as we've collaborated, and we'll continue to collaborate with the with the surveillance program 
and uh, keep our communication going so we can address these issues of debt violations or attempted violations. Thanks. Good, you just yes. Are there any other questions? Questions from the commissioner's comments? Good. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number uh, K. Approve or disapprove agreement number 8-18-4, New Mexico Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management Fiscal Year 2018 Emergency Management Grant Program uh, Application Work Plan. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve A-18-04. Second. A discussion? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Resolutions. Approve, or dis approve resolution number R-18-8, a resolution amending the approved and adopted budget for the fiscal year commencing July 1st, 2017, and for county purpose in the county of Grant, uh, transferring and appropriating funds thereof. I move we approve resolution R-18-8. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, agenda item number M, approve or disapprove resolution R189, a resolution to accept roads within the Branding Iron subdivision for maintenance. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve resolution number R-1809. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Agenda item N, approve or disapprove resolution R1810, authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan and intercept agreement um, to finance. Do you have to read the whole thing? Uh, <laughs> relative to uh, the purpose of financing construction at uh, Whiskey Creek Fire Station. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve R1810. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, elected official reports. Looks like we have one elected official here. Would you? No report. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, commissioner reports. Would like to start, Mr. Castor? I, I have one one small thing. Uh, it came to my attention that June, uh, the meeting is uh, right on top of the New Mexico Association of Counties meeting, and I wondered if we would like to talk about either combining or moving or something giving all the press and public plenty of time to, to know that we were doing that. Appreciate you looking at it. So uh, currently we are set up for the 19th and 21st. The 21st would be the first actual day of meetings for NMAC. Uh, I think it would work for me to move them to the 12th and 14th. Does that work for anyone? I can do that. Let me check. I'll get it in Make sure I'm Looks good to me. I believe so. Okay. So if we can make those changes, that would be Is that okay? terrific. And just for the for the whole world to know, since there's all kinds of rumors out there about the hospital, no, I do not own any life point stock <laughs> at all. And Thank you, Mr. Going. Chairman. Other commissioner comments? Commissioner Brown? I have none. Commissioner Ramos? Yes, I just have a, just want to say a couple things. First of all, I want to uh, thank uh, the uh, hospital board for all the time and effort they have put into the hospital and the community, I mean, the community's needs. Um, they participate and never get paid, and uh, sometimes they take a, a black eye. <laughs> You know, so I've been part of the commission to to uh, approve and nominate these people into our board. And I just want to tell them thank you very much for what they do because it's a thankless job. And uh, I'd like to also mention this is the third administrator we've had in the last seven years since I've been a county commissioner. When I was told the average administrator lasts three years at a hospital, I thought to myself, not in our county, but that's pretty much what we've averaged. Thank, I'd like to thank my fellow county commissioners for sacrificing so much time and effort to do what is the best to, to do what is best for our county residents' medical needs. 
I know it's taken a lot of time out of my schedule. I know it's taken a lot of time out of everyone's. So I thank you very much. Uh, through this process, I know that we all have our best interests at heart for our residents. I know we all find it offensive when people that have no clue about the, the tough decisions we are having to make, yet people still make degrading remarks. I have my personal family that live here, and we're not going anywhere. Plus, I have lots and lots of great friends and many constituents, of course. Of course, I am going to look at all options with an open mind. We have to make the best choice for the future and the health care of our, of our needs and for our residents' needs. For those of you that have stopped me in public and asked questions, I thank you. For those of you that stopped me and argued that we are selling the hospital, I still thank you. For those of you that have shared some of your positive and negative experiences at the hospital, I thank you again. For those of you that have worked at the hospital and trust me enough to call me and give me your opinions, I thank you. For those of you that told me you trust that the commission will do the best for the county and ask us to make an educated decision and to use our common sense, I especially thank you for your trust in our commission. Another thing I wanted to just mention is I really like the idea of leaving our money local and I know that this commission has done the best they can to do this. So I really appreciate the proclamation. That's all I've got. Commissioner Edwards. So I would also like to um, acknowledge the uh, Board of Trustees and the hospital staff for the presentation that they made last Thursday. Uh, it was a great presentation full of lots of good information. Um, I um, want to acknowledge that uh, this has been a very um, substantial process and that I really, really appreciate uh, my fellow commissioners um, the amount of time and effort that they have given um, to this process and um, to just say that I have a lot of confidence um, that this commission will make the best decision possible for the community and uh, I really, uh, really, really have uh, appreciated working with um, the county staff, the county manager and the commissioners on this, on, on this process, which I believe um, is probably one of the most difficult decisions this commission um, will make. So thank you all very much. Thanks. I have no, no commissioner comments. I do have a question um, that was raised with me about the next agenda item and would like some discussion before we act on that. Uh, there's agenda item number P, which reads, any action necessary as a result of closed executive session. Is it standard to just explain why that's on there? It's on there because if you chose to take action in executive session, you owe the public the right to know that you may do that and you're going to come back out and take action. Okay. Um, in my opinion, it's best to place that on there than they know or they don't know, but... Okay. I, so is that is that on there? I should know this, but is that on there standardly? For it is now. It is now. We didn't forever, but since this has been so fast moving and fast paced, okay. uh, we put it on there. So I think it was probably... At the, the, at the end of every meeting, we tell them whether or not we may or may not come out by then, we should know. So the press and everybody didn't have to sit around. Okay. But we have to give this 72 hours advance notice. Uh, so we do. We give them notice that we may come okay, out. Okay, and I think it was the change that initiated the yeah. questions, and I wasn't real, I wasn't cognizant that there had been a change. So. Um, yes. yes. Since you've raised the issue, I'll throw my two cents in that uh, we should do our best to decide if we need to put that on there that uh, as a member of the public I have uh, been annoyed when groups imply they might make a decision but they know full well they won't. So I'm all in favor of having it there if there's a chance that we will need to make a decision. Uh, but when we know that we won't, I would appreciate it not being on the agenda. Okay. So it would be helpful if you guys came to a consensus on how you want that listed um, before I publish the agenda. And it's hard to tell on Friday before Thursday. Well, and yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I, I believe counts. that rests with the chair. Okay. And, and, and when in doubt, put it on. But if there's no doubt, okay. that's what I'm saying. 
Don't put it on. And there was, there was a little doubt in my mind because I think I'm quoted in the press maybe as saying that no action will be taken. And that's why I'm saying it right now. We know that. Yeah. We shouldn't put it on. Okay, that's why I wanted to have that. I was discussion. quoted by saying I don't think we're going to have an executive session. Oh. Which okay. I don't think we are. Is there any need to have an executive session? I see none. I see none. I see none. Okay. Uh, is there a motion for adjournment? So moved. All in favor? Four. Meeting adjourned. Um,